Welcome back to the classroom. My name is Mr. Wong, and today we're going to be looking at features of the universe in our module regarding Earth and space. So the lesson intention for today is to outline some of the major features contained within the universe. And our success criteria is to describe what exactly these features are. We can look at things such as stars, galaxies, solar system, and nebula. Okay, so just to give you a quick sort of overview of what the universe contains. The universe contains a variety of different galaxies. If you have a whole collection of galaxies, you get clusters. Inside galaxies, you get gas, dust, and nebula. Now, nebula is what we would describe the early stages of a star. It is essentially just a... Um, sort of cloud of gas and other dust particles within and then later on gravity kind of pulls everything in to make our protostar. We will talk a bit more about the life cycle of star in the next lesson. Today's lesson we're just focusing on the specific features. Okay, also inside the galaxy we have uh, comets and asteroids. Now sort of the difference between the two comets are sort of icy um, materials uh, that's in space. Asteroids are the uh, rocky kind of structures. Then we have the different stages of stars. We also have planets, which we'll talk about. And it's the inclusion of a star and planets. You get a solar system. I'll go through a little bit more detail how we differentiate uh, between those. Just to start ourselves off, we're going to talk about planets. Okay, we can actually split the planets into two categories, which we'll talk about later on. But you can see these two categories here. Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, uh, Uranus, and Neptune. So what exactly is a planet? Now, the definition for a planet can be a bit broad because, and we'll talk about it a little bit later, the first four planets we have is actually quite different from the last four planets we have in our solar system. But the basic definition is it is a, an object that orbits a star, this case being our sun, that has enough mass, so it needs to be really big, and it has a sort of spherical-like shape. It doesn't have to be a perfect circle or sphere, it just needs to have a shape similar to that, and that's caused by the gravitational force of the planet pulling all the components inwards. There cannot be other objects of similar size and similar orbit around the sun. So this will actually come into play when we talk about why Pluto is no longer considered a planet um, and why we have this definition of things called dwarf planets. Okay, so the two types of planets you can find in our solar system is terrestrial. So planets that are composed of mostly rock and metal. So if you look at the structure of Earth, you can see we have this sort of layer of silicate rock and then silicate rocks here. And then we have like a densely packed iron core. This iron core here actually contributes to the magnetic field of the planet. The reason why the magnetic field is important for our planet is it allows us to block off solar, ray, uh, solar rays or solar wind. So that's kind of the structure of all terrestrial planets. That consists of the first four, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. Once we pass that, we get the gas giants. Now, the gas giants are very different from terrestrial planets. One, firstly, it's not really much of a rocky structure. So there's no real solid sort of Earth uh, on these planets. In the very dense part of the core, there might be a little icy component to it. Um, but it's mostly made up of lots and lots of gases. So its greatest composition is gas, and it's actually a lot bigger than our terrestrial planets, hence why it's called gas giants. Now the question we need to go to next is, why is Pluto not considered a planet? Now this is something that was changed back in 2006, so it's quite a long time ago. Um, but basically speaking, Pluto is an icy surface. Now, if we look at the categories of what we talked about in the uh, two types of planets, we had terrestrial and we had gas giants. 
Pluto doesn't actually fit into any of these two categories. So that's one of the issue, firstly. It actually belongs to a location called the Kuiper Belt. And uh, the Kuiper Belt is basically an orbit where lots of icy comets are rotating or orbiting around the sun. Okay. Next to the, um, or next to Pluto, there's actually other types of um, dwarf planets that we now call. So you had Eris, you had Make May, Ceres. So these are all the different types of dwarf planets that's in the same orbit as Pluto. And as you can see, it's of similar size to Pluto. So like we said before, if the sort of um, celestial object, which is what we describe things in space, if the celestial object is surrounded by other things of similar mass in a similar orbit, it's not considered a planet. The other thing I want to show you is Pluto is much smaller than our own moon. So again, that doesn't work. That doesn't work with our definition. Hence why these um, celestial objects that you see here were classified as dwarf planets, with Pluto being classified back in 2006. Originally, why Pluto was considered a planet was one, they didn't actually find other dwarf planets at the time, and also the estimated size of Pluto was a lot bigger than what we actually know now. Okay, so you have your planets, they're rotating around our sun, and we get our solar system. Okay, let's look at the main features of our particular solar system, and then let's look at broadly what a solar system is defined as. So the first main part of the solar system is you need a central star where planets are orbiting around it. In our solar system, we have our terrestrial planets, that's split up by the asteroid belt, so that's where we get all the asteroids rotating around the sun. Then we get our gas giants, and then we get the Kuiper belt, which is where we find all the different comets um, rotating, all the icy uh, celestial objects rotating around our sun. Okay, the sun plays a really important role, as you would know, it gives us daylight, it ensures that on Earth we have photosynthesis, um, and there's all those kind of things there. The sun also all uh, provides us with the different tides, um, so the high tides and low tides. Not as strong as what the moon does, but it still plays a part. One of the other important things to understand is, although the sun is exerting a gravitational force on the earth, and that's why the earth is rotating around our sun, the earth is also applying a gravitational force uh, onto the sun as well. The person who came up with this idea that all objects exert a gravitational force onto each other was none other than Sir Isaac Newton. And he actually came up with that idea in the famous uh, apple falling off a tree and hitting his head, supposedly. So that's kind of the idea. So in terms of the actual features of a solar system, you need a central star with planets orbiting around it. So there's that. And it needs to include comets, asteroids, moons, dwarf planets, and just basic dust from the stars as well. So in our solar system, we have the planets orbiting around the central sun. We have an asteroid belt. We have the moons orbiting around Jupiter, Earth, Saturn. And then we have our dwarf planets like uh, Pluto. So those are the kind of features that you'd find in the solar system. As you can see here, we're getting from small to big, but we'll go back a bit smaller again and let's look at um, the sun, okay? So our sun is a star. Now the basic idea why we call it sun and not a star is because we want to differentiate the difference. Add it on uh, for much of the time, uh, in human history, we assumed the sun was something different to stars, but obviously now we know that our sun and stars are basically the same thing. It's just maybe different color variations as well. Okay, so majority of the composition of the sun is constructed of hydrogen and helium. Now, in terms of what type of state it's in, you might see the sun glowing and sort of having these um, solar flares pop out. 
Now, the sun isn't actually gas, okay? So it's not in its gas state, it's actually in a plasma state. Now, what is plasma? If you have seen lightning strikes or you've seen these plasma balls, that's what plasma is. It's a special condition or it's a different type of state from gas. So we know from year seven, year eight chemistry, three states of matter, solid, liquid, and gas. If you actually heat up a gas even higher, so at a higher temperature, the individual atoms will break into the individual ions. So if you recall cations and anions, that's essentially what plasma is to the point where the atom can't sustain itself and it breaks into its charged components. That's what plasma is. And that's the type of state that the sun is in. Okay. So our sun is a star, but planets orbit around it. We actually know that our sun isn't actually in the direct center of our solar system. It's actually also orbiting a small confined point uh, inside that solar system as well. So there you have it. We actually have a different way of recording different sizes and temperatures of stars, and that's using the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. So you can see these are all the different um, colors that stars can have. So the coolest stars, so the stars that have the lowest surface temperature is on the red scale. And then the brightest, the hottest stars have this sort of high blue ultraviolet type color. Our sun is actually very small. Our sun is actually on the lower end of the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. So it's a bit more here instead of what this diagram here shows, but it's a bit more down here. It's very small. Okay, when the sun dies, it becomes a giant, so it kind of gets bigger. So that's where the idea that when our sun dies, it will uh, destroy Earth, because when stars die, they actually expand exponentially. And what scientists predict is it's going to take up all the terrestrial planets. So that's another insightful thing for you there. Usually then it will actually form what we call dwarfs, or white dwarfs, things like that. Um, so it's just a highly concentrated, densely packed um, dead star, basically. You might see things like these called the supergiants. Um, we will get into a bit more of that in our next lesson about the life cycle of stars, but essentially if the star was originally really big, like the blue stars here, they'll become supergiants. And these are the ones that lead to uh, what we call the neutron stars and black holes and supernovas. Our sun can't create a black hole basically because it's too small. One of the benefits of our sun, given that it has a lower temperature, is it will live longer. Our sun has a lifespan of about 10 billion years, while as the stars on this side, blue end, is about 1 billion years. Another interesting fact is our sun has gone through half of its life cycle already, so it's about 5 billion years old. And then we go a bit further and we get into galaxies. So you see all these little uh, bright spots here. Besides being dust and gas particles, that's also individual stars within a galaxy. So we have the planets that's inside the galaxy, or not the galaxy. So you have planets inside solar systems, which have stars, and then you get into the galaxies like so here. Okay. Our galaxy is known as the Milky Way, and I'll give you a fun fact about our Milky Way later on. But galaxies are just a huge collection of gas, dust, and billions of stars held together uh, by the force of gravity. The galaxy in which we belong to is known as the Milky Way, like we said. It's basically a disc-shaped structure with sort of spirals uh, coming out from all the young stars. If you actually go to central Australia where there's not much light pollution, you can actually see the actual Milky Way there. You can actually see it at night time as well. If you look into the night sky and you see a cluster of stars, that's sort of the faint shape of where the new, uh, Milky Way is all centered as well. If we have a group of galaxies, we call that a cluster. So let's just review in terms of the different sizes of the universe. Firstly, once we get our universe, we have our clusters. 
Clusters is just a group of galaxies. Inside the galaxies, you'll have uh, stars, which are the second sort of, well, it wouldn't be the second biggest, but if we count in solar systems, so we have our galaxies. Inside our galaxies, we have solar systems, and then we have stars, okay? Some stars might be bigger than the solar system, depending on the type of star it is. Our star is obviously smaller than our current solar system. And then you have the planets. And smaller than the planets, you'll have things like comets and asteroids. And as we said as well, nebula that you see here, that is the earliest stage of what a star is, which we'll talk about later on as well. Okay, so I said I'll give you a fun little trivia. So the speed of light is a measurement of how uh, fast light moves. And then we talk about things called light seconds, light minutes, light years. Uh, a light year is essentially how far time or light would travel within a human year. So if we had 365 something days and we were traveling at speed of light throughout all those different days, how long would it take us to reach a certain point? Well, light from the sun to hit earth is eight light minutes. So that means the light that we see from the sun to us is there is an actual eight minute time um, interval. So if we look at the sun, which you shouldn't, or let's say look at Mars, we're actually looking at Mars 12.7 minutes in the past, because that's how long it took light to reach us. For us on Earth to move from one side of the galaxy to another, because in our Milky Way, we're actually on the very fringes, it takes us 52,000 light years. So that's quite a long time. And that also concludes our lesson for today about the different features of the universe. Our next lesson will be talking about the life cycle of a star. But either way, thank you for joining and I'll see you in the next lesson.